So good morning, everyone. I'm Kim, and I'm going to just first of all introduce our panelists. Um, so I've switched. I have got. Well, I'll start with Jay. <laughs> um, Jay, on my far left, is a senior research scholar at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, specializing in cyber conflict, competition, and cooperation. Prior to this, he was founding director of the Cyber Statecraft Initiative at the Atlantic Council, and from 2003 to 2005, was director for cyber policy and cyber infrastructure protection at the White House. He's also a former U.S. Air Force intelligence officer who had uh, jobs uh, at the Pentagon and the NSA. Uh, next to um, Jay, I said Jay, Jason, um, is Lilia Blan, uh, is an information scientist at the RAND Corporation where she does technical and policy research on cybersecurity, emerging technologies and other issues. Prior to RAND, she worked for the Defense Department, uh, helping to create various cryptographic and network exploitation technologies. And she's also the proud owner of a black Uber badge from DEF CON. To my, <laughs> to my right, um, we've got Trey Herrer, um, is a postdoctoral fellow with the Belfer Center's Cybersecurity Project at the Harvard Kennedy School. He focuses on trends in nation-state malware and the underground criminal markets for malware. Previously, he worked with the Defense Department as well to develop a risk assessment methodology for infosec threats. And to Trey's right is Katie Masuris, founder and CEO of Luda Security, which advises companies, lawmakers, governments on the benefits of hacking and security research. She's also, as you all know, an authority on vulnerability disclosure bug bounty programs, having been the driving force behind Microsoft's bug bounty programs and an instrumental partner in helping the Defense Department launch its first bug bounty program, the Hacking the Pentagon uh, issue. She's also a visiting scholar with MIT Sloan School, doing research on vulnerability economy and the exploit market. So uh, the format we're going to do is I'm just going to, uh, we're going to take care of a little um, definition stuff so that we're all clear on what we're talking about and why we're talking about this. Um, then we're going to have uh, Trey and Lily do a brief presentations on their papers and then we'll get into um, the, the meat of that and then we'll take your questions afterwards. So um, first of all, before we get started, um, briefly Jay, Tell us what the VEP program is um, for anyone in the room who doesn't know and what it does. Great, thanks. Hey, good morning. Thanks for coming. So, look, we're at Black Hat. Most of us are more comfortable with the technology. We understand bugs, and, um, but we might not understand the VEP. So, back in the prehistory, like 15 years ago, two decades ago, NSA or other government um, information warfare, cybersecurity folks, when they would discover a new vulnerability, they had to say, all right, are we going to keep this or are we going to tell the vendors? Richard Baitlick has a great story when he was at um, Air Force CERT in the late 90s and he found a Cisco vulnerability, router vulnerability, and he told Cisco and the offense folks in the Air Force came by and said, don't do that, right? That's not your decision. You give it to us, the offensive side, and we'll decide if we're going to tell Cisco or not. Huh, right? I mean, I'm not sure that's... That's really one of the offense folks to decide if, if, um, if that's the right decision. So in the government, they said, we need this process. So the director of NSA had an internal process where they would say, we'll go through, we'll figure out how bad is this bug? Is this extensively used in the US infrastructure? Um, how hard is it to try and figure out? Is it likely that a lot of people are going to figure it out? Or is it this is going to be nobus, nobody but us, nobody but the U.S. that can figure this out? So now they had this pretty good process. But at the end of the day, it was still the director of the NSA that, that was making the decision. And so a couple of years ago, the U.S. government, um, especially after Snowden, said, no, nah, we need to do a little bit better on that. So now it's a White House process. So now the president runs that. And so NSA and the other more offensively minded folks, DOD, intelligence community, they're just one of the seats around that table that says, all right, here's the new bug, here's the criteria um, that we're going to assess. And now if the other defensive minded agencies like DHS say, no, we think this is serious and we need to get this patched right away, um, if they don't like what they get out of that process, they could escalate all the way up through the NSC chain theoretically up to the president himself. So the main purpose of this process is to try and buy ourselves more security, to try and figure out this decision. Are we, is the United States, is the internet better off if we plug this? Or should we use it for some time 
to try and figure out what the Russians are doing, trying to figure out if Islamic State or Al-Qaeda is trying to attack us, use it for espionage or potentially offense purposes, and to try and do a smart trade-off on that. That's not the only purpose. Um, it's also there just for that interagency process, right? So that the defensive-minded agencies feel like they've got some voice on what's going to happen to these bugs, right? I'll bet uh, there's a chance that Eternal Blue came out before this process. And so imagine you're at DHS, you're trying to make America more secure, you're trying to tell people to patch, and then you find out in the news one day, oh my God, like what did we just do um, when these come out? And so you want a process inside government where you can bring that to uh, everyone together. The third purpose of it is not just for the government, but for the government to go to the public and to go to Silicon Valley and the vendors and say, look, we've got a process from these, we're being adults about this, we're not keeping everything and that we do have this process to come and talk to you about that. So when we were doing our report, uh, Columbia University we did a report on this last year, we briefed it at, at DEF CON, we didn't have a lot of good information about how many b vulnerabilities were being kept by the government, how many were being released, and whether it made any difference. And so now I think with the reports that are coming out, we're learning a lot about... So we numbers. don't have a lot of data on that, just excuse me for interrupting, yeah. just because um, the government has, this is the only, thing, the only statement they've made about it, they, um, a, they claim that they disclose 91% of the vulnerabilities that, that they use in the U.S. And then right. the other 9%, they say, um, are vulnerabilities that were actually disclosed before they got a chance to disclose them, or they were ones that um, I think got fixed prior. Yeah, or, yeah, they were already fixed. They also include things like tr that, that were trivial, um, or they don't include if it was outdated, right? I mean, so right now, if they had an awesome XP right. bomb, they're not going to try and talk about that because Microsoft probably, you know, probably isn't going to patch that. So from the, from the government's perspective, what we're talking about when we're talking about collisions and rediscovery, they're telling us that it's a really small portion of things that they're withholding, um, and, um, but the rediscovery and collision rates are still important for... Right, it's absolutely critical. As if you're saying, I, I would bet many of the people in Washington D.C. that are going through this process were saying, well, if we've got it, probably other, you know, everyone else does too, or a lot of other people. I would have guessed if you talked to them, they might have thought, no, there is a maybe 50-50 mm -hmm. of, of if we've got it, then probably someone else d does. Um, and so I think as this comes out, you know, we're learning more about what those rates are going to be. We're learning how much security we're buying. And if I can do one shameless shout out. Yeah. Um, uh, one of my uh, colleagues on the academic side, Joe Nye, who I just happened to see, said, this is a weird kind of conflict because if we develop a, n a nuclear weapon or we get rid of a nuclear weapon, it doesn't change everybody else's nuclear weapons. Right? We're not disarming others. And this, in, in this field, if we reveal a vulnerability and we tell the vendor, we're taking that out of everybody else's arsenals. But that's mostly true if you've got high rates, if everyone is having the same, same vulnerabilities. If it's having a very low set of vulnerabilities, then we might be buying less security and less disarmament than we actually think. And I just want to add one other thing. I think you're, um, I just one other thing about that 90% thing. When the government says that they disclosed 90%, they don't tell us how long they withheld those before Correct. they disclosed them. Correct. So 90% may be that they, they held on to something for 10 years, but oh, they disclosed it, so um, now they can put it in that figure. We don't know, just because they're, they're not answering questions, follow-up questions about that. Um, so uh, that's giving us the overall, did you want to say something before I jump into the? Just, just a note, to be clear, when there's disclosure, it's not necessarily that it's out of someone's arsenal. Uh, disclosure doesn't necessarily mean that the vulnerability Correct. gets patched right. or that that patch exists and then it gets applied. Right. It's just in public knowledge. So Good. whether or not right. that makes Correct. someone yeah. more vulnerable or less vulnerable, more secure or less secure. Okay, yeah. so that just sets the stage for why um, these reports uh, were done uh, in the first place to uh, provide some information uh, po for possible reuse in policy making. Um, why if, if, if there is a low collision rate, then it contributes to the argument that it's okay to stockpile zero-day vulnerabilities if the collision rate is high um, and the chances are good that someone else might discover them and use them, then of course you want to reevaluate whether or not you're um, withholding. So, um, so two, the two papers, main papers that we're talking about today are um, the first one um, that we're going to discuss is Lily's paper, Zero Days 
thousands of nights, the life and times of zero-day vulnerabilities and their exploits. Uh, so it was done by Lily and her colleague Andy Bogart at um, the RAND Corporation. Um, and this is the first publicly available research to examine a database of zero-day vulnerabilities that are still currently unknown, and I'll let her tell you where they come from, um, but they're still in the wild. Many of them are still in the wild and being actively exploited. So, really? Great, thanks. I have a few slides for this, so I'll just grab the clicker. Um, so uh, the motivation for the study is, as Jay has pointed out and Kim has mentioned and many of others have talked about, um, uh, publicly available information about zero-day vulnerabilities is sparse. Um, uh, they're often shrouded in secrecy. Um, and when questions come up about them, uh, certainly collision rate or the percentage of vulnerabilities that get independently rediscovered and redisclosed in a given time period is, is something that people care about. Um, they also care about the longevity or the lifetime of a vulnerability as well as the life status, whether or not something is a vulnerability or not. Um, these can help inform discussions uh, like the VEP, but also uh, uh, discussions that vendors are having, uh, uh, discussions that pen testers and security researchers are thinking about when they're thinking about what bugs to look at. So our research, as Kim mentioned, looked at a data set of more than 200 vulnerabilities and their exploits. Um, uh, we, our data covered more than 14 years, or 14, a 14-year 14 time span from 2002 to 2016. Uh, and came from a vulnerability research group which we dubbed Busby uh, to protect its anonymity. Um, many of Busby's products are used by nation states. Uh, many of Busby's researchers have worked for nation states. So we considered this data set to be um, comparable to the capabil capabilities and skill level of a nation state or a government. And the data set that we had had information about things like the vulnerability class, source code type, exploit class type, vendor, who the exploit developer was, and then when they found the particular vulnerability. Um, uh, when we think about the various uh, who searches for vulnerabilities, we broke it up into two different groups, those who search for vulnerabilities to make them public knowledge, those who search for vulnerabilities to make them for, for private use, and you can break up those for private use into blue and red. Um, a lot of the bugs that get found for public disclosure might be kind of bug, uh, those that are in, um, those that bug hunters look for, those that are in bug bounties. Um, that's kind of that, the green circle there. Those who look for vulnerabilities for, to, uh, for private use, um, can, we broke them up into blue and red, where blue would be, think, would be the, uh, in the sense of governments or the nation states. So it would be us and our allies, where red are the opponents or the adversaries of blue. So this is not red team, blue team uh, penetration testing. This is from a government, nation state point of view, military point of view, red and blue. What Jay was alluding to, and what Kim has mentioned as well, is what this purple overlap is. This is really where the VEP um, thinks about. Um, how much overlap, or what are the characteristics of the vulnerabilities in this purple overlap? How much overlap there is? If there's a lot of overlap, then, then the opponents, the adversaries, blue and red, are finding the same bugs. If there's little, then they're finding different bugs. So this is really what we want to know. Um, now, I had data, the data that we had, the Busby data, was uh, a proxy for blue. Um, I didn't have access to uh, data for red. If you have access to data for red, I'd love to talk to you, then I can help refine our research. So what we did in our, in our study was to look at the public-private overlap, or the, the private-public overlap between blue and then green. And specifically, we looked at life status, longevity, and collision rate. What we found is that there's granularity to calling a vulnerability, uh, uh, it's misleading to call a vulnerability either known or unknown, zero day or non-zero day. Uh, we found several different categories. We called them alive, living, immortal, dead, zombie, uh, and uh, several more. I have the link to the report down at the bottom. The next thing we looked at was the life status or the, or the longevity, the lifetime of a vulnerability. How long will it remain privately known before it becomes publicly disclosed? And what we found in our data set is that our data lived for uh, the, average, uh, uh, the average lifetime of a zero-day vulnerability and its exploit lived for 6.9 years uh, before it had been disclosed. Uh, this gets us to the title of our report because 6.9 years is also 2,521 days or nights, so zero days and thousands of nights. 
Then the third thing we looked at was given the knowledge of a group of vulnerabilities, what percentage of those get independently rediscovered and publicly disclosed given a in a given time period? If that time in interval evaluated is a year time period, then that collision rate, the percentage that gets, uh, that gets independently rediscovered and dis disclosed is 5.7%. As, it, as, this, uh, as our findings relate to, so our findings can help inform those in offense, those in defense. It can also <laughs> help inform those that are in this, uh, that are thinking about the government retention versus disclosure discussions. And we're not trying to tell, what the, tell you what the answer is, but we simply see that our data can help inform these discussions, can help inform both those who are pro-retention, those who are pro-disclosure. Pro what we see in our findings is that in our data set, this data set that is a proxy for what a nation state or sophisticated private use group might have, the long average lifetimes and relatively low collision rates might indicate that vulnerabilities are dense, which means another vulnerability can often be found, or vulnerabilities are hard to find, and these two things are not necessarily mutually exclusive. That said, uh, those uh, could make the argument for pro-disclosure that since the, vulner since the collision rate is non-zero, that there's a probability, no matter how small, that someone else, especially in an adversary, might find the same vulnerability, uh, would help support the argument to disclose that bug. Of course, hoping that the disclosure would also be combined with a patch release and that patch applied. That's a very, very brief overview of our study. Um, I, I, wel I welcome you to check it out at that link. And just to underscore that, I, thank you for correcting me. I had said that these are vulnerabilities that are currently being exploited in the wild. These were defensive, not offensive. Uh, no. Uh, what, okay. Uh, did I misunderstand the blue and the red? Uh, yes. So our data set is, is it's not uh, blue defense, red offense. This is blue, U.S. and its allies. One could make the, the oh, analogy. Okay. U.S. and its allies, red could be an adversarial country. Okay. So this is uh, uh, one, what could be used offensively. Uh, by a nation state. Okay, great. Um, okay, so now we're going to switch over to Trey's study, uh, which came out, was it two weeks ago or a week? Last week. Last yeah. week. Um, taking stock, estimating vulnerability rediscovery uh, was done by Trey and Bruce Schneier and Christopher Morris. This uses a much larger data set, but it involves currently disclosed vulnerabilities, primarily submitted to bug bounty programs. Um, and it also in, involves data from, for example, as uh, Google's uh, Chromium's fuzzing project. So, Trey? Great. So thanks again, everybody, for coming. And for those of you for whom this is the first post-hangover panel, welcome. Uh, what we were trying to address is a sort of recurring question. We've had this debate about how often two different people find the same vulnerability for an extended period of time. And most of the time when you get into this debate, it involves napkins and sort of scribble calculations and very anecdotal discussion and evidence and data. The problem with that, obviously, is that this has a significant impact on the policy debate around government disclosure, but also on the way companies run bug bounty programs and the way that they prioritize patching. So what we were trying to do in this paper is to bring a more empirical approach to this issue of how often two different parties find the same vulnerability. This is a quick summary of our data set. Uh, we looked at four different versions of software, Chrome, Firefox, Android, and the library OpenSSL. Uh, the Aggregate rediscovery rate for this entire data set came out at about 10.1%. Now, there's two issues with that number. The first is it obscures variation between software type, and the second is it obscures variation over time. So as we're stepping through this, I just want to very quickly go through, this is an, our aggregate change rate over time. So we're not splitting out by software yet, but it shows us a little bit of the difference as we're moving through. And this data set, although it's constituted primarily in the early days by Chrome, sees a lot of Android and Firefox vulnerabilities as we go through. So this notion of rediscovery is really important. Our definition is two independent parties finding the same vulnerability. We don't make any assumptions about who those parties are, their skill set, their resources, their motivations, why they might be doing this discovery, or how well or how long they might be doing it, which is really important, because that's something that's come up. And part of this discussion is about what are we actually talking about. For our purposes, rediscovery is two independent parties and stops there. So previous estimates using data had come to between 1% and 6%. Uh, the Keystone study for this is a piece of work that was done by uh, a researcher at Cambridge, Andy Osmet, who formerly of DHS, now at uh, Goldman Sachs, had reviewed some data from Microsoft between 2003 and 2005, looking to see how often they credited more than one person on their disclosures. Found that that rate hovered about 4 to 6%. 
Using this data, what we found is that the rediscovery rate is a little bit higher, actually between 10 to 15 percent. Breaking it out by software type, you can actually start to see how much variation there is between these different code bases. In this plaf, orange is Chrome, blue is Firefox, green is Android, and gray is OpenSSL. A quick note about OpenSSL, because this is important. OpenSSL is an open source project, and for a long time, for a long time, they've been supported on a shoestring budget by a couple of volunteers, very few paid full-time professionals. What that means is that most of their energy and effort has gone towards mitigation, not necessarily towards accurate record keeping. So one of the problems that we had in trying to parse what data we were able to get from OpenSSL is how accurate they were about recording when disclosures came in from multiple people. Right? At the core, once a bug has been disclosed, you can begin to mitigate it. The second disclosure, the third disclosure, the fourth disclosure don't really change the underlying response process on the part of those securing the software itself. So there's often not an incentive to accurately categorize those second, third, and fourth disclosures. As an example, the OpenSSL data that's available on the web has a record for the disclosure of Heartbleed, which most of you probably have heard of. What's missing, though, is that there was two disclosures. So Heartbleed was discovered within a few days by both Neil Meta of Google and the company Codenomicon. Only Neil Meta is uh, credited on the database. So we wanted to include OpenSSL to try and show some diversity in this, but we're a little bit suspect with that record keeping, so we have some limitations there. So a couple of quick takeaways. First, the rate of rediscovery has an impact on the policy process. Bugs that I hold secret, presuming their secrecy, are ones that I could use for some period of time in an operational way. The challenge is if those bugs are rediscovered by another party, I, in this case the US government, haven't given the vendor an opportunity to create a patch for that software. Now Lily and others are going to make a very good point, which is disclosure does not equal patch, and patch being available certainly does not equal patch applied. But these are very separate parts of the process. VEP is a very small part of the overall software security discussion and focus just as on this critical oversight function related to how governments disclose vulnerabilities. So this rediscovery rate tells us what's the likelihood that this stock that I have around, that I have actually available to me, are likely to be discovered by another party while I'm still using them and keeping them secret. There are two other implications here as well, because we're not just looking at VEP. The second is looking at how product, excuse me, patch, product churn in the malware markets. So what this is is the notion that a vulnerability, once it's expired, has declining use for different types of criminal actors. So you can actually use a rediscovery rate to try and generate a, a stock renewal rate in looking at these different products. How often is an exploit kit, for example, going to have to renew the exploits that are embedded in it? The third is patch prioritization and informing bug bounty programs. Essentially, how am I paying for bugs that I think are likely to be discovered by multiple parties as opposed by one that's unlikely to be found by all but that one very talented researcher? In terms of patch prioritization, if a bug has a high rediscovery rate, I should be pushing that up the ladder in prioritization because the chance that I've been given it through a patch with the vendor means that it's also likely to be found by many other parties, whereas if that's lower, I could possibly push that down the rate. So these are a couple of quick implications to the research, but I think we want to get into the discussion, so I'll let it there. Thanks. Um, and Katie, um, you guys, you, you presented a paper two years ago at RSA um, looking at some of the same kinds. You used a different methodology for your study. So what was the methodology that you used, and why did you choose that? So what we did uh, two years ago at RSA in, in uh, conjunction with MIT Sloan School um, was we did a system dyna dynamics model of the vulnerability market. And as part of that, we did look at bug collision rates, but we quickly realized um, that the rate of bug collisions vary with target, right? Um, you know, if you have a fixed code base, you know, as, as the, you guys were looking at, at different, different code bases, different pieces of software, you're looking at it in terms of a model. This is what we did. So we, we were looking at if vulnerabilities are scarce in that fixed code base versus vulnerabilities are dense in that fixed code base. The statistic likelihood of a bug collision is higher when there are more vulnerabilities in the code, meaning more vulnerabilities because the code base itself in that fixed code base is less mature and has more bugs. Um, the reason why we had to model it is because it's actually really difficult to extrapolate anything about even the next version of that same piece of code in terms of what the rate of bug collision is. So we looked at it as, as sort of a density modeling problem. Um, this actually takes us back to my old days of fighting all of those bug counts equal, you know, CVE counts equal less secure. Right? Do, does anybody remember when vendors would try and compare the security of their similar products? Like, you know, uh, one database vendor would have a chart of how many CVEs it had versus the other database vendor's CVEs, and how they were trying to say that because they have more published vulnerabilities found, 
that they're less secure than the ones who had fewer. And that was a completely erroneous way to try and compare the relative security of two different code bases. So in those days, what I was trying to do was make sure that there was no false correlation between completely unrelated things. And so to me, when I look at the question of the vulnerability equities process and whether or not bug collisions should factor in, I look at that as actually completely unrelated things. Mm. And the reason is that you can't actually extrapolate anything from one fixed, you know, one fixed piece of software's bug collision rate to even its next version's bug collision rate. You add new features, things change, different researchers enter the scene, and then there's also the problem of you know, omnipotence in this space. There's no real way to use any of the published data or even private data that some folks, uh, you know, that some folks are, are correlating to know what is in the mind of hacker number one, hacker number two, hacker number three. So again, I think that for, for purposes of informing policy decisions around the vulnerability equities process, we, need, we certainly need to look at the balance between our, you know, our, our duty to preserve national security and protect our critical infrastructure and you know, our offensive capabilities, which we need to maintain you know, our, our, our ability to, to combat and to potentially gather information you know, during regular intelligence activities. So why do these studies then, I mean, what do, they, what do they contribute for us? Okay, if it's not so helpful for the P, is it helpful for the other purposes that you were talking about in terms of patch um, and things like that, patch policy? I mean, I'll open up to everyone. I mean, what do these studies, are they worthwhile? What do they tell us? What do they offer to well, us? Well, one of the things that, you know, again, getting back to that old bug counting, you know, fallacy of, of this piece of software is more secure than, uh, than this one because of the number of CVEs, what I would encourage people to do, instead of comparing completely different code base to completely different code base, even if it was the same type of product, the only real good measure is comparing yourself to yourself. So saying, you know, this version of, of you know, SQL is, has fewer bugs than uh, the last version. And so I think that is a meaningful you know, way to kind of measure progress over time of, of trying to reduce the number of vulnerabilities in a given piece of software. But that doesn't necessarily, again, like I said, I think, I think these topics are not only, you know, they're not just orthogonal, they are, they are unrelated. And, and I, what I'm really concerned about is that interesting studies like this are being misapplied to draw conclusions for policy decisions. And so I think we, we just need to be really, really careful about how we start to approach a, a generalized um, you know, assumption looking at specific data, data sets for specific target software. Trey, do you want to respond? No, to that? so I think this is interesting, right? And there is, so three points. Um, first, there's obviously a role for simulation and modeling data. You know, one of the challenges about this space is that there are some real difficulties in obtaining access to the information that we'd want to truly make the decision. And Lily's already made a reference to this, right? To get accurate, collision data. We'd like to look within the Chinese stock and within the U.S. stock and see how that overlaps over time. Probably unrealistic as a research goal. If that's someone's aspiration, I, I fully support you. Uh, so that's issue one. Issue two, though, is that we still have the opportunity to gain some fidelity of understanding from looking at what's actually going on in the space. So the notion of modeling and simulation can contribute a lot to our understanding about process and structure, but it doesn't necessarily replace tracking behavior and actually capturing the performance of a system and the activities of the different actors. So they're certainly complementary, which I think is an important part of this discussion. The third, though, is with respect what's being looked at. It's more than just counting security. And I, I would argue I don't think either study really is trying to characterize the security of software by counting bugs. But rather, it's No, I wasn't implying that. Oh, okay. yeah, I, no, I was good... just reminding people of this, this was a fallacious way to compare security of different products. Mm -hmm. And I, what my assertion is is Similarly here, I think we have a well-intended attempt to kind of get your head around some useful data and then use that to, to make some policy recommendations, so such as the VEP process or maybe even other policy recommendations. And that's what I'm saying is that much like that erroneous uh, CVE counting and comparing across completely different product lines, 
I am, I'm asserting that this is also an erroneous specific data set to specific data set that actually doesn't help us make any decisions in the VEP process. That's what I'm asserting. Right, so I think yeah. it's good we move past this, this bug counting for security issue, but the point I was gonna make is that both of these data sets are describing not only the characteristics of software, but the behavior of the community of researchers doing discovery, which is a really important point because parsing those two things out isn't necessarily what we've both been focused on, I think, in terms of rediscovery and collision. There are studies that look at vulnerability discovery, characteristics of discovery patterns, skills, and how those vary with different types of code. But this rediscovery and collision issue, I think both, is related, are looking at both that population as well as the underlying software. Lily, did, did you want to respond? Go, go ahead, Drew. I do, but go ahead, Jay. No, no, no. I'm so um, it's interesting. I'm going to have to be working through um, Katie's point here on, on as I think through this. But you've got this big debate. You know, there's a lot of us that say the government needs to be doing better and it needs to prioritize defense. And it's really tough because we in government, there's not, well, uh, for those in government, there's not a lot of knobs on where you get to decide whether you're going to prioritize defense or offense. There's very, very few places where you can do that, especially because we don't have a strategy that says which is more important. Right. Even in the last administration, President Obama would say, it's a balance. Well, when you're actually in government or at NSA or Cyber Command and you've got to decide, well, what the hell does balance mean, right? I mean, when I've now got this decision about whether how to make America more secure by keeping or um, disclosing this bug, what am I supposed to do? And so the, about the only knob that we've got right now is the VEP. So I think there's a lot of us that are saying, well, are we doing this too defensive, too offensively, or about right. And one of the major conversations for those of us that like really push defense, myself, Robert Kanaki, and others, um, we like the VEP and we say, let's do it more and let's do it better. There's a really strong counter argument by Matt Tate, Dave Vitell, and others that say, that's stupid, because out of this VEP, you get so little value from each new bug that the amount of time you're spending on this is just a waste and it's a dumb idea to begin with. So we're really desperate for these things like the collision rate, like what Lily had said earlier about are bugs dense or are, or, or are they sparse? Because that helps us figure out are we actually buying down our risk with all of this that we can do? And I just hope that we start getting other dials, other knobs that we can turn because we're making way too much over VEP. It's more important than it, re than, than it really is because it's the only knob we've got. So, Dick, can I, can I uh, address like that, that point? You want more knobs, more dials you can turn. That was the point of our doing the, the system dynamics modeling a couple of years ago because this is systems level thinking here. These are things that, that you know, uh, trying to play uh, whack a bug on a very dense code base is not going to be the best lever. So, the, the whole vulnerability sparse and dense conversation, how many of you remember where that actually originated from? Dan Gear mm -hmm. giving a keynote in 2013. And the assert so this was the inspiration for the research that I did with MIT Sloan School because his assertion was if vulnerabilities are dense, just kind of writ large, if vulnerabilities in especially in critical infrastructure are dense, then uh, you know, it's not going to make a difference to try and play whack a bug, you know, and, and maybe try and buy all of those bugs and, and whatnot. And then he asserted if vulnerabilities are scarce, if software code or if code quality from a security perspective in general is getting better, then, the, then his recommendation was the US government should defensively buy up as many critical vulnerabilities as possible. So that was his assertion, saying that it would be possible to corner the market and basically drain the swamp of, of vulnerabilities. So that was, that was where that originally came from. And so we, we sought to address the question, what is the, mo you know, what is the most yeah. effective lever in the overall system? And that's why you know, a lot of this work, we're looking at it as, as very dynamic. And that, that's essentially why we chose this modeling approach. Are, are you taking one bug out of 100 or one out of a million and you should have very Right, is it statistically system. significant? Will it make a difference? Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the whole thing. Uh, hmm. Different than sparse and dense is also easy to find, hard to find. Yeah, yeah, if, yeah, yeah. if bugs are dense, but they're really hard to find, then it doesn't matter that they're dense. They're, they can be hard to find. Those things can be all the same. Um, in terms of the, the various 
studies, we all have different approaches. If you're interested in uh, um, looking at it from a heuristic point of view, a theoretical modeling and simulation point of view, there's great information on that, uh, great information on, on vulnerabilities. If you're interested in the world of what bug bounties are, are, um, are finding, what bug hunters are finding and being disclosed to vendors, then certainly that's where trace, uh, trace research can help inform. If you're interested in the kinds of bugs that are being kept for use by, by nation states, that are difficult to find and that are uh, used for offensive operations for uh, purposes of that matter, then that's where our research comes into play. Um, and the, the bugs, all bugs are applicable to be considered for the VEP, um, but, but the ones that I would think would be uh, majorly debated within the VEP are the ones that are hard to find or are, are ones that are used by the nation state. Yeah. I will say again though that before uh, disclosures or VEP will ever be the solution, uh, we need to fix patching and because patching is the major problem when applying the, the patches. Can I, can I jump in on for a second? Yeah. So this is an interesting part of the debate that doesn't get dealt with specifically enough. Uh, I would argue, and I think this is, a, is a, a fun point to parse, that VEP is distinct from patching processes in companies for two reasons. The first is that VEP is intended to be an oversight function on the government disclosure and use of vulnerabilities, a necessary uh, element of operating in a modern computing connected environment, without question, right, from an intelligence standpoint, from a military standpoint. But also an issue where these are pieces of information which absolutely could provide benefit to individuals, security to those individuals, if disclosed to a vendor and patched. So we have this balancing test between achieving outcomes and security by using vulnerabilities and achieving outcomes and security by disclosing vulnerabilities. VEP is intending to try and calculate the cost and balance between these two spaces. That is distinct from the vendor behavior, which is my second point. One of the things that gets really challenging when we talk about VEP is it gets very all-encompassing and becomes the thing, and it, it soaks in energy and attention and all through the room. But it's a tiny piece of the software security puzzle. There's no question that patching processes are a huge issue. Patch application especially is something that we just have not dealt effectively with as an industry and as a community. But VEP is distinct from those, related, but distinct. And so I think that's really important that we're not going to solve what companies are doing, not going to change vendor behavior just by how government discloses vulnerabilities, however many of them they disclose. I agree. That's, it's, it's a different topic, certainly. And, and to me, the VEP is almost as much about managing outrage as it is about actual risk. Right? I mean, when you've got you know, a new shadow broker's release to the rest, the VEP is one of those processes by which the government can say, look, we're trying to do our best. You, don't get, don't get outraged, we're trying to do the right thing here. And it's almost, it, I'd say a lot of the benefit that the government might get out of it is about perception and trying to just handle the outrage and, and, and calm people down. We already have people lining up, so yeah. I, I, even though I have other questions, I want to jump yeah, to yeah. you guys and let you guys. Oh. Hi, yeah, uh, Mike myself from uh, Red Hat. Um, I, I worry that the whole way this conversation is being framed as offensive and defensive yeah. is, is really missing a huge point which is that um, this is not a zero-sum game. It's not about, and I'm a Brit, but I get, you know, I'm part of Five Eyes, so we get to see some of this stuff too. Um, it's not a, about just defending United States government or even about defending yeah. United States businesses. In a global economy, this yeah. is not a zero-sum game. Giving out these uh, vulnerabilities has the opportunity to improve the world economy and improve the Commonwealth, and I use that in the old sense of the term, not the British Commonwealth, right? Um, well, that's nice too. Um, and it's not just about, you can't just say that people in the red circle are against the people in the blue circle, they're also against people in the green circle, because they are against the Commonwealth and the global economy. Yeah. And I think if we phrase it just in terms of defense and offense, and in terms of nation state, offense and defense, we're missing a huge thing here. So certainly what we had there was a simplistic point of view. That was for, for pictorial illustration purposes. There are more groups in each of those uh, than, than each of those. Uh, I, I would ask though, is it the government's responsibility to make the world secure? Is it the government's responsibility to uh, make a mom and pop shop secure? Or uh, So yes it is. Yeah. And maybe, I, I, I don't know if the DHS 
is the right people to do that. I don't know if you have a uh, Department of Trade and Industry. If so, they're the people who should be on, yeah. the, on the VET panel, not the DHS and the... Well, the others should yeah. be as well. But you need those sorts of people in as well, or you're missing a point. And, and this is part of what one of the recommendations from the uh, VEP and my, our, our colleague, uh, Richard Kanaki, who used to be part of this process, was saying, right now, NSA is still the executive agent that runs the VEP, and we need to do away with that. It needs to go to DHS. It needs to be the defensive organization. Um, one, I'm, I'm happy to say the UK is one of the few other governments that's actually come out and talked about disclosing vulnerabilities to the vendor. Um, and uh, the last bit is this goes back and forth in Washington, D.C. quite a bit um, of are we, is Americans, I'm going to stay with America for a second, is American national security better served by having a safe, secure internet that's going to be here to drive innovation in the United States and around the world? Or are we better served by having all of the high ground in the internet to make sure that we can spy and take ad against, our, uh, against our adversaries, and I'm sorry to keep putting this in U.S. terms, but in this goes back and forth a lot, and, um, and so it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out over the next couple of years. So one thing, oops, sorry, sorry, one thing that's important to note here, so there is a bill that's been put forward in both the Senate and the House called the Patch Act that's intending to codify this equities process and the criteria associated with review for vulnerability, and one specific criteria that they mention is the type of software involved. So what you would expect, not unreasonably, is that you would weigh if something is, for example, a widely used cryptographic library that is not unique to the United States or is not unique to a particular country versus a proprietary piece of software like, say, MeDoc that only shows up in one particular state. So I think that is something that's become part of the debate. Katie, you want to add something? I lost my point because we're... Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Joe. Um, hi. Uh, hey, Joe. Great panel. Thank you. Um, I guess I, 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 uh, I'm really happy that there are these studies coming out, and I think that... Um, it's early days, and hopefully there'll be better data and possibly more more relevant stuff. But my main question is for Lily. Um, can you give me a little bit? Uh, and you know, if Jay or Katie want to jump in, that would be awesome. But can you give me a sense of what you think the best pro and con arguments are for why or why not the green circle is a proxy for red? Because it's not obvious to me that it is. It's uh, it's not a proxy for red. What, so I, I gave a very abridged version of, of, our, uh, of our study and what we looked at. It's, it's a proxy for what the public is. I, ideal would be to have access to, to multiple private data sets to, to try to examine the characteristics of the overlap. Since we didn't have access to multiple private data sets, we looked at the private public uh, overlap, the green and the blue, to uh, find some baseline numbers that could be used uh, to help inform discussions that go between the, the, the blue and the red. It's, it, there are certainly caveats to our research. I think I, uh, sorry, I think I've, I've remembered what point I was trying to make earlier. Um, so just, you know, just to be clear, the, the modeling that we did a couple of years ago, the conclusion on the VEP process that we had was that it was much more beneficial for, uh, to err on the side of disclosure. Um, and the reason for that is if you think about it, if we're playing a game of capture the flag and we've all got the same flags, what do you think, you, what do you think is a smart thing to do to protect your critical infrastructure? And in terms of preserving your offensive capabilities, do you actually need zero days to achieve most of your goals? And, and you know, the answer is, is a resounding no, and we definitely see that that mirrored in general you know, exploitation of software that we see in the world. Zero day exploitation is at that tippity top of the pyramid, if any of you saw Alex's keynote, opening keynote, um, the major you know, source of actual harm in the, in the internet ecosystem is this broad base of feature abuse. You know? so, so that's, to us, that was the conclusion was that the VEP should err dramatically on the side of, of vuln disclosure because that actually does preserve the main goal, which is we've got the same flags as everybody else. So I know we were, I know we were kind of dancing around that topic, but I just wanted to say that the, the prior work two years ago, that was the conclusion. Joe, I'll continue with that actually, just to, to continue with what I had been saying. While it's not necessarily uh, um, a proxy for red and blue, what we had was a data set of blue. Up until now, there's not been any publicly available information about what might be a proxy for what a nation state has. So we're not just looking at the, uh, the collision rate, but certainly what are the characteristics of 
the types of vulnerabilities that live for a long time or that might be used for nation states. And we, we do, I, I want to see this level of analysis going in on the shadow brokers and figuring out what was in these, how many, we still don't know. I mean, there are no researchers have gone in and said, how, how many of these did we act, were actually not known? And so I would really like to know, because we do have a blue data set, yeah, that would, unfortunately. That would be great. Right. I'm sorry, who wants yeah. the next question? The Go first ahead. thing I want to say before my main question is I think the government is, an, is a potential enabler of, in, of improving uh, critical infrastructure and, and remediating vulnerabilities. All right, I don't want to certainly get into, and I know uh, Lilia Blon is, is perhaps involved, as I know some people in Rand are, with the, with the whole question of the laws of cyber warfare. And there have been a number of papers on that, particularly from your colleagues at RAND. Um, let me, however, get to the main question. That is to challenge the notion that you really can't, you can only really use one sort of universal code base as far as, you know, doing these kinds of vulnerability studies. It's because so many products now are open source or come or use a, use a you know, a, a large part of their product is open source. You know, there's a lot of open source being by almost by definition that is goes throughout the creative world, all right. And is and it's these are the kinds of vulner of sources of data where uh, you know where this kind of research is 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 particularly appropriate. And I don't see that being done here. And I don't see any. Uh, any you know future attempts to do it? So you know if you if you use let's say you know for example you know a lot of people use cont use containers for example whether it's Docker or or or, or you know Kubernetes or something else, all right? But the kind of research you know based upon that because that goes across a whole. La large number of products. Sorry, I don't, I don't want to interrupt you, but we're out of time, so, we, let, so me, let them answer. Thanks. Yep. Well, I don't know what the question is. Um, <laughs> the, question, the question is a challenge to the statement of you can only do these kinds of, the kind of research you're doing with just a single p code base as opposed to comparing one code base with another. I still don't understand soft, yeah, well, what, soft, what is I mean, who was tweeting earlier this week? Software reuse is vulnerability reuse, right? Yeah. I mean, the more that we're using, you know, that we're using the same, you know, the software in, in the common libraries, you know, the places we're seeing these end up in a lot of places. And I think we end up with a lot of concentration risk. And I think we learned this with Heartbleed and OpenSSL of you know this critical vulnerability on a lot of on um, some code that just didn't, wasn't having as many eyes on it as required for such a critical function. We have time for a quick question. Quick one. <laughs> okay. So quickly, uh, Sorry. we've discussed a lot about the density bugs and, and vulnerability disclosure, but there's a problem with the fact that a number of bugs out there can simply not be patched. And how do we address the disclosure of those things and how do we factor in the impact of those? And also, in addition, even when we uh, disclose vulnerabilities, we have such a long cycle for those bugs to be patched, and in cases there are people who don't even know that they have those bugs on their systems and they don't patch them. So how does that factor in it? So, so this is a killer point, absolutely. I think the, the pushback has to be twofold. The first is, again, in disentangling patch and VEP, we have to look at patch and patch adoption. Patch application is incredibly important. The, the time delay associated with how often individuals and organizations have to wait for a second vendor to validate, for example, a, an operating system patch before it can be applied is a tremendous burden on that, on that security process. There is some work that's been done with this. Um, I would encourage you to, to poke around the Belfort website. I think there's a couple of pieces that address this. But I would say, too, the other thing is, when we're looking at patching, when we're talking about vulnerabilities, that process is dealing with only a portion of the security landscape. So I think all this discussion is not to remove capabilities necessarily from the government. But as Katie's pointed out, there are a variety of ways to get to the same end. You don't necessarily have to sit and rely on the same vulnerability. So there are a number of paths there. Anyone want anything before we close? Yeah, I mean, I think we, I think, I think we as people who really, really care about this process, we, we need to make sure that we're, we're trying to speak the same language and we're counting the same things and applying them to the same problems. Because I, what I see over and over again is really well-intended efforts um, to, to inform policy decisions 
that are, are just somewhat orthogonal or unrelated. And so I just want us to get on the same page about it and really, um, really concentrate on what will actually have the best effect. I think that's what we all want, is we all want the best effect. Um, and we have disagreements on methodology on how to get there. And the government is having these conversations, right? I mean, they are trying to figure out, all right, how, how do we do this? What's the right kind of process that we can have? And I bet they're, they're, they're brawls as they try and talk to what the best things to do are. But you do have this offense-defense conversation as they're trying to figure out the right thing. Okay, great. Everyone, thank me. join me in thanking the panelists for our